let me share my screen. Tom, would you like to, uh, to make yes. it welcome? Welcome everyone to Sephardic World. And as always, we'd like to thank our patrons who make these meetings possible. Um, so if you will further like to uh, support us, please join our Patreon website and make a small donation. Everything is welcome. And uh, I would also like to remind everyone that you, this will be recorded. So if you don't want your, uh, your face uh, recognized, please stop your video. Um, you can put questions that you have in chat and David and I will keep an eye on that and uh, relay them to Stephen Nathalos. Um, Stephen Nadler is a professor of uh, philosophy and uh, the history of philosophy. And he specializes in the 17th century. He has written on Descartes and on Spinoza, Leibniz. And he also works on medieval and early modern Jewish philosophy. His, uh, his work includes uh, biography, uh, biographies on, uh, <clears throat> on Spinoza and on Menasseh Ben Israel. And his newest book will be on, also on Spinoza, Think Least of Death, Spinoza and How to Live and How to Die. And maybe that's an app title, title for these uh, troubled times. So over to uh, Steve and David, if you can stop screen sharing. Yes. Welcome, Steve. All right. Um, thank you, Ton, and thank you, David, and thanks for the invitation uh, to speak today. I'm going to open up my screen now and um, share the PowerPoint. All right. Um, so I'm not going to give a broad uh, presentation of Manasseh's life, but I wanted to focus on um, a very interesting aspect of a rabbi's life in the 17th century, and especially in Amsterdam at the time. And this is uh, Manasseh ben Israel's relationship, uh, both with the congregation that he served and with the other rabbis. Oops. So... This is not Manasseh ben Israel, uh, even though since the 18th century, this Rembrandt etching was identified as a portrait of Manasseh ben Israel. In fact, uh, we know pretty certainly that it's not. Uh, you'll still see it identified as a portrait of Manasseh in catalogs, uh, but this is not Manasseh. This is not Manasseh ben Israel either. Um, this is a portrait of a man by uh, one of Rembrandt's contemporaries, Chovet Flink, um, this is from 1637, so done just a year after that uh, first etching was done. Uh, this has often been taken to be a portrait of Manasseh ben Israel. Perhaps it is, uh, but the, all the evidence suggests that it is not Manasseh. This is Manasseh ben Israel. Um, and we know this, first of all, because it says it's Manasseh ben Israel. Um, this is an uh, engraving by Salam Italia, who was an artist originally from Italy, uh, Mantua, but eventually uh, settled in Amsterdam. Um, and he uh, created this uh, portrait of Manasseh. Um, as engravings go in the 17th century, there must have been a painting that this engraving was based on, we presume. Uh, if so, that painting is long lost, uh, but this is supposed to be a picture of Manasseh at the age of 38. So who was Manasseh ben Israel? He was born, um, and I 
am pretty certain he was born in Lisbon. There's a great deal of disagreement about this. Some people say he was born in La Rochelle, France, which is one of the stops that the families made when they left Portugal in um, the late, uh, in the early 17th century. Um, other accounts have him being born in Madeira, um, but in documents from the period in which Manasseh describes his own birthplace, um, it is always Lisbon. Um, and so I take him at his word. And so we'll say that Manasseh was born in Lisbon in 1604. Um, he died in Middleburg on his way back to the Netherlands from England, and that was in 1657, although he is now, as, as you know, uh, buried in Amsterdam in the Outer Kerk Cemetery, uh, just 10 kilometers or so outside of Amsterdam proper. He was um, the son of Joseph ben Israel. Uh, the family's original name, Manasseh's original name, was Manuel um, Diaz Soero, but when the family settled in Amsterdam, they took the name Ben Israel. So Manasseh's father was Joseph Ben Israel. And they settled on a street that we know was called the Nieuwe Hartgracht, but we're not quite sure where that is. And I've consulted various experts, and the best we can come up with is that Manasseh lived somewhere along this street, perhaps where that blue arrow is pointing. Uh, this is on the Vleuenberger Island, um, which was part of the city's expansion in the late 16th century. Um, this whole neighborhood um, is often referred to as Vleuenberg. Um, this canal right here that my arrow is following is the Hautkracht. Um, this street here is, was called the St. Anthony's Breistrat, um, also the Breistrat, now it's called the Joden Breistrat. Um, Rembrandt's house was right here which is where the Rembrandt House Museum was. For those of you who are wondering, and there must be many, Spinoza's house um, was somewhere back here. Um, this has now been filled in and it's the Waterloo Plain in Amsterdam. And if you wanna pick up a pair of wooden shoes for cheap, this is where the flea market is and the Stopra building. Um, but in this time, um, the Jews who were arriving, or should say the conversos or new Christians, the Portuguese merchants who were arriving in Amsterdam at the end of the 16th and the early 17th century, tended to settle either on this island up here, or if they had the money along this street here, the Breistot, which was also home to Amsterdam's art world, which is why Rembrandt was living here right next to the house of his dealer, Hendrik Arleberg. And the, the magnificent Portuguese synagogue in 1675 would be built, um, I believe, right around here. So this canal has also been filled in. Here is the uh, title page of one of Manasseh's books, perhaps his most famous book in the time, The Conciliator or The Conciliador. It was uh, published uh, uh, first in Spanish, and then there was a uh, Latin translation. This is uh, a work that Manasseh worked on throughout his life. And it, he's, he's essentially in this work trying to um, show the consistency of all of the passages of the Bible. And so he addresses a number of apparent uh, contradictions. Um, was, uh, was woman created out of man's side or were man and woman created at the same time? Going through the whole Bible, uh, the whole Hebrew uh, Bible, and rendering, attempting to rendering it as internally consistent. Uh, and it goes right up through uh, the Psalms. Sorry, my computer. This is a, um, a manuscript um, that we have in Manasseh's hand. And it's a letter to Isaac Volschus. Uh, Isaac Volschus was the son of one of Manasseh's good friends, Gerardus Volschus who was a great humanist scholar and at one point engaged Manasseh to teach Hebrew to Isaac and to his other son. So Manasseh was himself a prodigious student. And we know that by the age of 18, um, having studied with Isaac Uziel, and we'll consider the rabbis in a minute, uh, he himself began to take on uh, rabbinic duties, even if he wasn't yet officially appointed as a rabbi which he would do 
1622, uh, after the death of his teacher, Uzio. So here are some of the rabbis in the 17th century. And this is before the union of the three congregations in 1639. There was Isaac Uziel, who was originally from Fez, uh, now Morocco. Um, and he was the rabbi for the Neve Shalom community. Um, the Neve Shalom was one of the earliest communities. Uh, the first community in Amsterdam, uh, that is a community of Portuguese Jews, um, was the Beth Jacob community. And this, the rabbi um, of this community after uh, its early years was Saul Levi Mortera. Uh, he was born in 1594. He was of Ashkenazic, not Sephardic background. Um, he followed, he was from Venice uh, and he followed his uh, mentor, um, a physician to Paris. But when uh, Montalto died in Paris, uh, Mortera brought his body to Amsterdam for burial in the Adekirk Cemetery. And Mortera stayed and became um, one of the rabbis and will later be the chief rabbi. Uh, next, we have Isaac Abu Abdel Fonseca, who was from Portugal. Um, and he would eventually become the rabbi of the Neva Shalom community. Uh, and then David Pardo, who was the son of another early rabbi, Joseph Pardo, and he himself would become uh, the rabbi of the Beth Israel community. Now, all of this was before 1639, before the three communities, uh, Beth Jacob, Neva Shalom, and Beth Israel, um, merged into a single community. It was not a seamless and entirely easy merger. And even before this time, there were tensions. Each community had its own congregation. It had its own rabbis. It also had its own way of doing things as congregations will. Um, but there were also joint projects, uh, charity um, and the burial grounds. Uh, these were jointly overseen by a committee of the three congregations. But at a certain point, they realized it really was not feasible to continue to have three separate congregations. And so after much negotiations, they merged. And in 1639, um, they formed the Talmud Torah congregation, which is still the congregation, uh, still the Portuguese congregation in Amsterdam. After the merger, we have the following, I mean, one of the things they had to negotiate was what to do with all these rabbis. Uh, they had to be put in some kind of hierarchy. Salaries had to be divided up. Um, and uh, both um, liturgical and administrative duties had to be assigned. So Saul Levi Mortera was made the chief rabbi of the Talmud Torah community. He was to give three sermons per month uh, and teach upper level Talmud classes. Um, and was paid 600 guilders a month. Second in rank was David Pardo. Um, he would be the administrator of the Beth Chaim Cemetery. Um, he would be paid 500 guilders per month. He would do some teaching. It doesn't seem that he was given any formal um, preaching or sermon duties, um, at least as far as, as I know. Third in rank was Manasseh ben Israel, who was now a full-fledged rabbi and had been for some years. Uh, he was also, I should say, um, a printer at this point and became, uh, the, so the subtitle of my bi biography was going to be um, Rabbi uh, Manasseh ben Israel, the most famous Jew in Europe, uh, the most famous Jew in the world, because through his printing and through his own writings, Manasseh had become primarily the, the the spokesman for Judaism to the Gentile world. Uh, Christian scholars, whether they were Protestants or Catholics, would often consult Manasseh when they wanted the so-called Jewish perspective on this or that issue. So uh, Manasseh was written to by one point, at one point by Paul Felgenhauer, who was a Christian uh, Messianist, a millenarian. Uh, Felgenhauer was putting together a book on free will which was, of course, a very controversial issue, especially in a Calvinist country like the Netherlands. But Felgenhauer wanted to know what the Jewish perspective was on free will. So he wrote to Manasseh and asked for his view. Uh, and Manasseh gave him a, a very nice um, 
summary of the Jewish view, but decided rather than having Felgenhauer publish it in his book, Manasseh was going to write his own book on free will and sin, which is a very bold thing to do. And I think is one of the things that got him into trouble with the community. We'll come back to that in a second. So Manasseh is now a rabbi. He was uh, a printer. Um, he owned the first Hebrew printing press in Amsterdam and was um, an enormously important bookseller and printer publishing uh, Judaica in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in Dutch, in Latin, um, and as well, not just liturgical books, but works of poetry, works of philosophy, and works of theology. He really was the most important Jewish publisher in the 17th century. He, in the new hierarchy of the Talmud Torah congregation, um, was given one sermon per month, um, but no formal teaching duties, at least according to the records. Um, but we do know that he was teaching in the elementary levels of the school, the Talmud Torah school, um, and thus would have been teaching um, uh, basic Hebrew and uh, Bible, especially Torah. He's often said to have been um, Spinoza's teacher. And in fact, he's often claimed to have been Spinoza's intellectual and spiritual um, inspiration. Uh, in fact, I, I think that cannot be right. Uh, first of all, we don't see Manasseh teaching the upper levels of the school when Spinoza, if he had been attending the upper levels of the school, would have been there. When Manasseh did briefly take over the upper levels, Spinoza was not, as far as we know, a member of that class. But more importantly, when you look at the kinds of positions that Manasseh takes on various issues, on miracles, on the Messiah, on the immortality of the soul, on the resurrection of the dead, on the consistency of the Bible as a divine word, on all of these issues, there's nothing, you couldn't imagine anything more opposed than what Spinoza would say on just those topics. Spinoza rejected the immortality of the soul. He rejected uh, superstitious beliefs about the origin of the Bible, about Jewish law, about miracles. And so I would say that in fact, Manasseh ben Israel and Spinoza were intellectual opposites. They really had nothing in common on substantive philosophical and theological topics. The only reason one might think that Manasseh was some kind of intellectual guide to Spinoza was because Spinoza eventually ends up um, in Christian society, although he did not himself become a Christian, he never converted. And Manasseh ben Israel himself was um, was well, uh, was a very cosmopolitan figure and had a lot of intellectual relations with Gentile scholars and others. And so perhaps this openness to the Gentile world has led people to think that Manasseh must have been the one who inspired Spinoza. But as I said, I really think that's just another one of the mythologies. And there are many um, mm -hmm. around Spinoza's life. Mm -hmm. Finally, fourth in rank is Isaac Aboab. He was to give evening sermons. Um, he would teach in the upper level of the school, and he was to be paid 450 guilders per month. Do you see the problem here? Yes. <laughs> Mortera, 600 guilders. Pardo, 500 guilders. Aboab, 450 guilders, despite being behind him in rank. And poor Manasseh in Israel only gets 150 guilders per month. This was a slap in the face, and it may have been intended as a slap in the face uh, to Manasseh. He always, throughout his life, felt underappreciated and undervalued by the Amsterdam Portuguese Jewish community. And he felt that the community went out of its way to put him in its, his place and even to diminish his value. And so this feeling of underappreciation, I think, he was right. I think he was underappreciated, and I think he was undervalued. Um, however, and this is, brings me to my main uh, topic today, I don't think Manasseh was himself without blame for the nature of his relations with his congregants, and especially with the Parnassim, that is the lay leaders of the community. One of the tensions in the Amsterdam Portuguese community was about the locus of authority. Who was in charge? 
Um, and in Amsterdam, at least on paper, there was no question that it was the Parnassim, the members of the Ahmad, who were the leaders of the community. They were the ones responsible for setting the regulations of the community. They were the ones who were even responsible for issuing harems against those who needed to be punished. And the rabbis chafed under this authority of the lay leaders. And that brings us to our first conflagration between Manasseh and the, um, the uh, Parnassim. In 1640, um, there were appearing in the neighborhood some posters which um, accused various members of the Jewish community of unscrupulous business practices. And they were accused especially of trying to maintain a monopoly over the trade, the Brazil trade, that is the, the, merch the merchandising of sugar and tobacco and other goods from Brazil, which at this point was still Dutch Brazil. The Dutch had taken over uh, various parts of Portuguese Brazil. And there was a Jewish community there, and we'll come back to that in a second. And so these posters were put up around the community, alleging that some members of the congregation were engaged in unscrupulous business practices. And it looks like one of the people who was putting up these posters was Jonah Abrabanel, who happened to be Manasseh's brother-in-law. Manasseh had married um, Jonah's sister. So Jonah was called before the Parnassi and uh, the accusations were made. And Manasseh resented the way in which his brother-in-law was being treated. And especially the fact that when he was called before the, the Parnassim, he was not given the honorific uh, senhor, that is sir. Um, and so Manasseh started to berate the members of the Parnassim for the way they were treating his relative. And so from the, uh, the, the book of Askamot, that is the records of the leaders of the community, we have this account of what happened. Um, hold on, I have to move the, there we go. This all took place in the synagogue. A large part of the assembly left its place. The assembly being the, the members of the board. Whereupon Manasseh turned on them Without being, willing to calm, without being willing to calm himself, as he was continuously warned to do. In other words, they were saying, Manasseh, shut up, stop it. You're, you're, you're coming pretty close to the line. Until finally, two Parnassim of the synagogue stood up in order to make him be quiet. So Manasseh was complaining about this treatment of his brother-in-law. And indeed, since they could not do it with sufficient words, used the punishment of harem. So a harem was basically putting somebody uh, on the outs. When you were under harem, it was not just a, a religious sanction, it was a social and economic one. If you were under harem, not only were you not allowed, if you were a rabbi, not allowed to preach, you, you couldn't partake in services. Um, a, a whole world of Jewish life in Amsterdam was out of bounds to you until usually until you uh, paid a fine and made an apology. Uh, the most famous harem of the period, of course, was Spinoza's in 1656 for his so-called, uh, quote, abominable heresies and monstrous deeds. All right, so uh, the Parnassim ordered him, Manasseh, to stop and to return to his house. And he countered with a loud voice, he would not. Then the Parnassim, who were in the synagogue, came together. And since the disturbance continued further, they confirmed the punishment of the harem in order to make him, Manasseh, stop. And they ordered as well that no one shall speak with him. Did Manasseh stop? Whoops. No, he did not. Raising his voice and pounding on the table, Manasseh said in a serious fashion all the unbridled thoughts that came into his mind. Unfortunately, we don't have a record of what those unbridled thoughts were. So that finally, one of the Parnassim apprised him that he is the cause of various disturbances the Parnassim told him to leave the chamber and that they regarded him as cut off. He responded, and this is my favorite part, he responded to that with loud voice that he was putting them under harem 
and not the Parnassian hymn and other such shameful things. So that was pretty characteristic of his relations with the Parnassim. The, the harem was only for one day. And if you look in the record books, the, the book of Askamot, you can see that um, they actually subsequently pasted over the page with the harem. And there's a little handwritten note there that says, out of respect for Rabbi Manasseh. Um, but you know, archivists have been able to remove that uh, and uncover that page so we know exactly what the record book says. So that was his relationship with the Parnassim. Now, what about his relationships with the rabbis? Well, first of all, let's take Rabbi Abuab. There was no love lost. Um, and here's a, an image of Rabbi Abuab. Um, there was no love lost between Manasseh and uh, Abu Abda Fonseca. Uh, they were students together under Isaac Uziel. They were about the same age. But Manasseh resented the fact that Abu Ab, though lower in rank than he, nonetheless um, had more duties, teaching duties and preaching duties, uh, and also a higher salary. Their first confrontation occurred in 1629. Uh, Manasseh wanted to publish a book called the Sefer Elim by Joseph Solomon de Medico, but the Parnassim were uncertain about the orthodoxy of this book. Um, it was a rather unorthodox book. And so they withheld permission from Manasseh to publish this. Well, Manasseh thought, well, if you're not going to give me permission, let's see if I can get it somewhere else. So he appealed to the rabbis in Venice. Now, the, the, the uh, congregation in Venice um, was a kind of mentor congregation to the Amsterdam Portuguese. Uh, and they gave Manasseh approval to publish the book, which he went ahead and did. Meanwhile, uh, a committee in Amsterdam censured Manasseh for publishing Del Medigo's Sefer Elim. And Rabbi Abouab was one of the members of that committee. Now, we don't really have anything from Manasseh's hand complaining about this, his treatment by Abu Ab in particular, but this must have wrangled him that one of his uh, fellow rabbis um, would presume to censor him for something he was publishing. In 1640, um, the Jewish community in Recife in Dutch Brazil was looking for a rabbi. Manasseh wanted that position. Um, perhaps to get out of Amsterdam and to become himself the chief rabbi of the congregation. Uh, but who got the position? Aboab got it. Uh, and this was, you know, this was tough pill for um, Manasseh to swallow. At the same time, resentful of the fact that Aboab got the position he wanted, nonetheless, it meant that Aboab was now out of the way, out of Amsterdam in 1641, which meant that Manasseh could assume some more teaching duties, do a little bit more um, of preaching in the synagogue, and his salary uh, got, he got a raise in salary uh, during Abu Ab's uh, absence. This lasted for a couple of years. Um, his salary now went up to 600 guilders a year, which is quite a significant increase. Unfortunately, by 1654, um, with the fall of Brazil back to the Portuguese, the Jewish community they had to disperse, um, as you all probably know, a, a good number went around to the Caribbean, to Curacao, uh, some went to New Amsterdam, but a fair number went back to Amsterdam, and among those returned to Amsterdam was, much to Manasseh's chagrin, uh, Rabbi Abouab. So Abouab is now back, Manasseh gets a cut in salary, and he loses whatever teaching duties he had assumed in Abouab's absence. So that's Manasseh and Abuab. Things are even more interesting when we look at Manasseh's relationship with the chief rabbi, Saul Levi Mortera. Uh, and this, we believe, is a portrait of Mortera. The two rabbis simply did not get along. And we have a, a number of documents, also in the Askamot, which record um, the deteriorating relationship between Manasseh and Mortera. In 1642, it appears that the two rabbis were sniping at each other 
in their respective sermons. Um, and all were told that it has something to do with the law. It seems though, if, if we dig a little further um, and look at other uh, literature from the period, the most likely explanation is that they were differing in their respective interpretations of Torah. Mortera was basically something of a literalist. He tried to, uh, he, he really was not in favor of dealing metaphorically or figuratively with problematic passages of Torah. Manasseh, on the other hand, and this is part of his project in that book, The Conciliador, Manasseh thought that treating some passages metaphorically or figuratively was the only way to make them consistent with other passages if read literally. So this sniping continued for a number of years um, and they were told, um, let me see, yeah, this is from 1642. Uh, here's what we're told in the book of Askamot. Um, Some unfortunate matters have arisen between Zenores Hachamim, rabbis, Saul Levi Mortera, and Manasseh bin Israel over six months in which each read the laws from the Teva. Um, not a lot of information there, but again, I think probably contrary opinions regarding how to interpret the law. Whether theoretical interpretations or practical ones, you know, what, what exactly, are, 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 were they differing over um, halakhic questions or questions of philosophical and theological interpretation? We don't really know. Then in 1653, so a little more than 10 years later, we read this document. This is February 10th, 1653. The men of the Mamad, having learned of some disagreements that have arisen between the esteemed rabbis Saul Levi Mortera and Manasseh ben Israel, um, and those, those how, the, how the names are spelled in the document, that are in need of remediation, uh, the men have determined that the said esteemed rabbis should be suspended from going up to the Ark of the Torah, giving sermons, and performing their duties for the amount of time that the men of the Mahmud see fit. Less than a week later, we see this document. We hereby warn the esteemed rabbi, Saul Levi Mortera and Manasseh bin Israel to restore a good relationship and friendship, if there ever was one, and to always maintain a state of decorum that the Mahmud would find satisfactory. Moreover, if between them there should be contrary opinions regarding matters of the law, on no account should they make this public, either within the congregation or outside it, without first coming to some agreement, and that neither within the congregation nor in public should they offend or contradict each other. Mm. Finally, uh, no, sorry, not finally, <laughs> Um, we have this document, which is um, a about a month later. Uh, this is March 21st, 1654. On the 3rd of Nisan, the men of the Mahmud, having considered the past disputes between the esteemed rabbis of this holy community, the esteemed rabbi Saul Levi Mortera and the esteemed rabbi Manasseh ben Israel, and the fact that once again they have fallen into a dispute We've agreed that the said rabbis should be suspended for two months from their rabbinical duties and giving sermons, and that during the said two months, they would not earn a salary, nor would they be paid in any way, neither with any type of goods, nor by any other means, nor with any type of luxury. One month after this, um, and this is April, 1654, um, there is a final entry in the record book on what, is on what they call the differences between the, the esteemed rabbis. We're told um, in this final document that the next time the tension, and quote, the tension between the two men, we're told that the next time that this breaks out, the person who initiates it and, quote, fails to fulfill his obligation and best keep the peace, that person will be removed from his position and forced to pay his fine. We're not told whether um, he's to be removed permanently or just again as a temporary punishment. Um, and we're also told, that's the last uh, document we have. We're not really told um, what happens. Uh, but we do know um, that slightly more than a year later um, in the fall of 1655, 
Manasseh is off to England. Um, on the one hand, uh, this was a religious mission because the Messiah would not come to a messianist, to a messianist like Manasseh. The Messiah was not coming until the Jews were scattered among all the corners of the world. But there was one place at least where they were not, and that was England, where they had been expelled in 1290. And so Manasseh saw this as part of his messianic mission to uh, foster the readmission of the Jews to England. But it's hard to avoid the conclusion that Manasseh was simply looking to get out of Amsterdam. And, by, um, and he went to London um, where there was a small, not so secret uh, Jewish community, again, Portuguese merchants, um, and worked on behalf, well, it's not quite clear who he was working on behalf of because the London Jews eventually came to think that it was a mistake to bring him over. A uh, parliament uh, never really resolved the question and initially declined to formally admit the Jews to England in 1656. Um, Cromwell, who Manasseh says invited him over, um, seems to have dropped the issue at a certain point. And the Amsterdam community did not like the fact that he was going over there in the first place. So if you were to ask me who was he really going on behalf of, I would say it was himself, uh, perhaps hoping to become the chief rabbi of a readmitted Jewish community uh, in mm -hmm. London. Sadly, uh, as you probably know, the mission came to naught. And in 1657, after being in England for more than a year and a half, um, his son Samuel, who was there with him, uh, died in London. Uh, Manasseh brought his body back to the Netherlands. He made it as far as Middleburg, but Manasseh himself was ailing and he himself died in Middleburg. Uh, and his body was brought back to Amsterdam for burial. And just as a, as a final coda for this, um, who got to read the um, eulogy over Manasseh but Rabbi Mortera? And here's, here is uh, Mortera's eulogy over Manasseh. Apparently, he was willing to forgive all their differences. This tzaddik, this righteous person, does not need an imposing monument or sarcophagus to honor him for the sake of his position. His words are his memorial. The words in the books he wrote will preserve his memory. Indeed, the truth is that he did have an honored position. His position honored him and he it. He was a teacher and a mentor from his youth in this distinguished place, in the greatest congregation of the region. And he honored his position through his distinguished achievements, which earned him constant praise and glory and honor. So those are the words of Saleh Mortera uh, at the funeral and burial of Manasseh ben Israel. So thank you um, for your patience and I'm happy to answer any questions that may come my way. Yeah. I'll stop the sharing, there we go. Thank you, can, can, can I just ask for a, a, a clarification? Um, what, what, what I understand you're saying is that if the rabbis in Amsterdam had had more emotional intelligence, um, a, a Jewish community would not have been reestablished in England, or not then. Is that, is that essentially right? Uh, I would say, no, that's not right, because Manasseh, I'm not quite sure how much Manasseh really contributed to the ultimate establishment of a Jewish community in England. I think, in fact, things might have sped up a bit if, if Manasseh hadn't stirred things up. Right. while he was over there. Okay. I think the, the, uh, that small community at a certain point decided that he was, he was too loud and too insistent. Uh, but you know, it's a great question. Um, what, what, would have well, what would the history of the English Jewish community have been had Manasseh not made that trip? Yeah. Um, uh, earlier, when you were talking about the, um, the salaries and, and, and the remun remunerations of the, uh, the rabbis in Amsterdam, a couple of people were commenting on the fact that if Manasseh was also publishing, maybe, maybe that was the reason that he had a, an alternative uh, income stream. Oh, the, yeah, the publishing was definitely an alternative income stream, but he was in financial need his entire life. He was always trying to get more money. Um, so in, in terms of salary, and if there are any rabbis in the gallery today, they'll know, you know, the, a, a, a nice 
representation of how much you're valued is how much you're paid as a rabbi. And the fact that he was getting so little else, uh, so much less than the other rabbis was a slap in the face. But yes, he, he was able to supplement that rabbinical income, both with printing and he was an important bookseller across Europe. But in his correspondence and in other documents, you see him constantly pleading financial need uh, yeah. in, in almost a sad way, I think. Okay. Uh, Paul B. to M, I'm guessing it's Buena de Mosquita, has uh, his hand up, Paul. So I will mm -hmm. ask to unmute. Hello? Hi, hi. <laughs> yes, uh, hi. thank you very much, uh, Stephen. I'm interested well, in knowing your, if others right, Paul, can from you put your the video Amsterdam on so I can see what. Can you, I just, uh, I can ask, let me just ask anybody who's going to ask a question if you could put your video okay. on so I can see the person asking. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. I'm wondering if any other, uh, other community members <clears throat> from the Amsterdam congregation followed Manasseh to, um, to England and to London. Uh, as there seemed to develop over the years a, a, a fairly large community there. I wonder if, if any of the people from Amsterdam followed him or if he struck out on his own. He, wasn't, he didn't strike out on his own because he was accompanied by his son Samuel. And uh, Samuel had actually gone on a scouting trip the year before um, with one or two other individuals from the Amsterdam community. But there was no, there wasn't... Um, a cohort of people who followed him over there. He was operating primarily as a free agent, although with the assistance of his son and uh, a couple of other individuals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, from, uh, sorry, Tom. Can you unmute Salomon Vaz Diaz? He also. Uh, I will. Well, while, while you're unmuting him, I want to answer a question from Stephen Weinstein. Um, you said if he was being paid just to give one sermon a month and he wasn't being underpaid and it wasn't a slap in the face, he was getting paid more per hour than those who gave many sermons or had extensive teaching duties. Well, in fact, he was underpaid because uh, Pardo, for example, who had uh, no teaching duties and no sermons, was still earning quite a bit more, not just a trillion amount more, but quite a bit more than Manasseh was. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, Solomon, you're unmuted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nad Professor Nadler. Um, very much appreciated. I was taught in Israel Seminary in Amsterdam many years ago that the main dispute between these two Chachamim, they were both Chachamim, between Mortera and Hashem in Israel, was about a sermon he held, Kol uh, Yisrael Yishlahem Chilek Lang Olam Abba, that um, the, the, the position in the New, in the world to come in heaven versus earth, where uh, uh, Mortera had a Maimonian point of view and Menashe Israel had a more Kabbalistic point of view. And in general, I thought you didn't say too much about it, that the main difference between the two was based upon the views of the Farah brothers uh, being against the Zohar and the Kabbalah and being very lenient with the law of Maimonides. That was the, 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 the he was a messianist, uh, Hashem Israel. But they worked also very much together. Uh, the second thing I wanted to ask Wait, you is about- I, Can I respond to that first point before you okay. go to the second point? Um, the dispute you're referring to about Olam Haba, that was not between Mortera and Manasseh ben Israel. That was between Mortera and Aboab. Thank you. Abu Abu was a Kabbalist, and um, he and Mortera differed. Uh, that that almost did create a schism in the congregation um, between those two rabbis. Thank you. The second question I have is about the first Hebrew prayer book printed in January 1627 by Menashe Ben Yisrael with an introduction in it uh, by Chacham Mortera. And uh, can you say a little bit more about that particular prayer book? It is the very first Hebrew prayer book in Spanish and Portuguese tradition wherever printed outside of Italy. So it's a very interesting book. And I'm wondering how was it received? Do you know anything about how it was used until 1639 when we had the Unyao? And 
since then it was used and more prayer books were printed. Uh, in particular, as one thing very interesting, it is anti-Kabbalistic. The rabbis were in the 17th century in Amsterdam congregation. It has Lechado D in it. And uh, I looked at the book, there is one of it left here in JTS in New York, and was very surprised to see that Lechado D is in it. Can you say something about that? Uh, that's a great question. I wish I could, but I, I simply have not come across any um, information or any documents which um, provide us with some insight as to how that prayer book was received. Um, and there may be somebody here in the gallery today who's no, who knows much more about that than I do. Um, it's a great question I, because it was the first Hebrew prayer book printed in Amsterdam um, at the time. Uh, and it was one of the first things that Manasseh himself printed. Um, before that, he had also written, which we have in manuscripts, his Hebrew grammar, but that was one of the first things to come off his press. I would love to have an answer to your question, and if anybody has one, um, I'd be interested to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, you have a question. Yeah, I actually have two questions. The first one is about the role of the split within the community about those who followed and those who didn't Shabbatai Tzvi. And the second one is about the petition that is supposed to have been led by um, uh, Manasseh ben Moses to um, Oliver Cromwell and signed by 12 Jews from Amsterdam. I wonder if you can say something about both of those. So the, the Sabbatai V episode um, was extremely strongly influential in Amsterdam. Um, it almost as if the community was overtaken by a kind of messianic madness. Um, I don't, um, so Manasseh was dead by that point. Uh, okay. So we don't not have any of his thoughts about that. Um, there's a really good biography of a rabbi who arrived, at, who was in and out of Amsterdam in the period, uh, uh, Sesportus, um, who was uh, trying to counter the, uh, the Shabbatai mania that was taking over the community. Um, and you could, uh, Jacob Dweck uh, just wrote a biography of Sesportus and he reveals the, uh, not just the events in the community, but the intellectual defense of Sabatai and Sesportus's um, opposition to it. Um, sorry, what was the second point? The second is about the petition to Oliver oh, the Crumb. Petition, right. Yeah, we, I mean, we is... have... We have the position to His, his Highness um, Oliver Cromwell, it, written in English by Manasseh. Um, and it leads us to suspect, this goes back to the earlier question about whether anybody went over with Manasseh. He was obviously supported by some members of the community, um, at least financially. And if we look at the names of that petition, um, they were given, giving him moral support as well. As far as I know, none of those individuals, um, and again, I'm not an expert on the history of English Jewry, um, none of those individuals followed him to England or ended up there at all. They stayed in Amsterdam. But they, what, here's, here's what I take to be their motivation. Um, this was um, right after the first Anglo-Dutch War, uh, which ended in 1654. And there was much to be gained economically by having a commercial base in London. And so to the merchants, to these Portuguese Jewish merchants in Amsterdam, it would be nice to have representatives, uh, agents um, in, uh, in London that is coming from Amsterdam to London. And so that might've been one of the motivations for their backing of Manasseh's mission. So Thank going you. back to what I said before, who was he acting on behalf of? Um, your question suggests that he was also acting on behalf of the mercantile interests of the community. Yeah, thanks. Francis was asking um, if we know what he was like as a, as, a, as a person, apart from always like arguing with his, uh, his colleagues. So it looks like Francis wants to say something herself. Okay, sorry, I, I, I can't see on the... Uh... She's pointing to her mouth. <laughs> okay. Okay, Francis, I've asked you to unmute if you can. Yes, great. Yeah, right. The kind of dialectic between what he was like as a human being. I mean, he obviously had a son who, who went with him. Was that because his son liked him? Were there people who liked him, who he lived with, who he got on with? And the other side of that is, of course, there was a massive political turmoil going on, the English Revolution, a complete 
upheaval was going on all over Europe. And I find that what's going on, as I mean, I'm not a historical detailed person, but looking at the, the breadth of upheaval that was going on, where was he and the Jews in that? Did it influence them? Were they inspired by what was happening? Uh, whatever, whatever. I know there was a change in this country, but how how were those interactions working? Uh, what so, was he like? What was he like? Um, my sense from the correspondence of others about him and their correspondence with him was that he was a somewhat charismatic man. He had uh, two sons, uh, Samuel and Ephraim. Um, wait, was it? Yeah. No. Um, Joseph. Sorry, I'm, Sorry? Joseph? Uh, Joseph, yes. Um, one son died as a, uh, carrying out uh, some, uh, he was on an ill-fated uh, boat trip. Um, he ah. died. Uh, Samuel died in London. Um, I'm sure they were very close because Samuel worked as well in Manasseh's printing shop and took over the business for a little while. Um, you get the sense that his friendships with Gentile scholars were warm friendships and people even... Um, people who we know were, um, if not anti-Semitic, not well disposed towards the Jews, if I might allow just that little tiny distinction for a second. Um, nonetheless, they all speak of as Manasseh as a good Jew. That is somebody who, who they like spending time with, engaging in discussion with. So you get the sense that he was a great conversationalist. Um, we know that he would go to their homes, that is Gentile homes, and have um, conversations with them. He would also go to taverns and meet them there because we have one report that um, he was in a tavern and it was around Passover and he was about to, uh, somebody offered him a drink but he noticed that there had been some beer previously in the glass and he was afraid that there might be still some um, non pacetic um, liquid <laughs> lying in the glass so he refused the beer. Um, the, the turmoil in England, is, it's a very interesting um, situation. And Lisa Jardine Europe, wrote in, yeah. sorry? And in Europe, but England. Oh, yeah, and in Europe generally. Um, oh, well, yeah, the Thirty Years' War was over. Um, the, the Republic was now an independent nation. Um, Lisa Jardine has written a very interesting book called Going Dutch about the relationship between the Dutch and the English in this, in this period. And um, my sense is that the... Um, the, the Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam, um, given their support for the reinstatement of a, well, there was still a, a, a stadtholder up until 1650 uh, from the House of Orange. And then after 1650, you have this uh, 22 year period without a stadtholder. But my sense is that the Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam were in favor of a reinstatement of a stadtholder. Uh, and especially because the person waiting in the rings, uh, William III, was the nephew of, of um, Charles II. Oh, right. Um, and so they would have been, um, you know, probably not great fans of the um, Cromwell regime. Yes. Uh, and yet they had to deal with the political situation there. And, and so that sort of chaos fed into, did it feed into the breaking of boundaries? The notion that you might change the boundaries of things, that there was an atmosphere within which that could happen. That's like, a great second order question. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, you know, the historical trends and the macro historical, de macro historical events, how well are they reflected in, in micro relations? Yeah. What we, what we do know is that um, the, um, the end, well, the end of the war for independence in 1648 allowed the Dutch economy to flourish in a way it hadn't been able to because of Spanish and Portuguese embargoes. Um, the question is though, was that good for the Jews? Because during those embargoes, it was the Jewish community in Amsterdam that was able to take advantage of networks long established networks through Portuguese and Spanish um, pseudonyms and relatives. But now that the Dutch merchants were able to move back in, um, was this in fact, um, did this in fact have a negative influence 
on uh, the Jewish merchants? I don't know the answer to that. I think that, you know, something, an economic <laughs> historian would have a much better view. Well, thank you, thank you. Yes, thanks, Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have a question. Um, we have a pretty good view of what Aboab, uh, Mortera, and Manasseh ben Israel were like. Uh, what about David Pardo? Uh, did you ever come across letters of him? Uh, whose side was he on in these conflicts? Maybe. I, yeah, I have to say, I, I don't have a very good picture of Pardo at all. Um, he seems mm. to be in the background. Um, we, as far as I know, we don't have any extant sermons by him, although I could stand corrected on that. Um, he's rarely referred to in the documentation, except you know for, for formal administrative matters. These are his duties. Um, so he, to me, he's a bit of a cipher. I don't really have much of a read on him. Mm -hmm. We know more about his father, Joseph Pardo, because these were the early years of the community. Um, but and, and he was a highly regarded, um, highly regarded rabbi for. And I'm blanking on which congregation he served before the union. Um, but no, I wish I did know more about him. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There's, um, there's a couple of uh, interesting comments in, in the chat. Ali is saying um, he believes that, that Raphael Supino from Livorno was agitating for resettlement of Jews in England in 1655, and he then became a, a Sabbatean. So maybe, maybe it would have happened uh, anyway, as you, 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 you say. And Kevin, Kevin says that the Dutch ambassador told uh, Cromwell's people that Manasseh wanted permission to bring refugees from Portugal and that uh, Jews from Amsterdam wouldn't come, which presumably is quite a contemporary sort of theme that basically uh, lots, of, lots of poor people would, uh, would uh, come pouring in. Do you, do you know anything about that? I do know that the, um, no, not, not on the English side. Um, I do know that the Amsterdam Jews <clears throat> had a refugee problem um, as of, in this period because of the um, refugee, the, um, the returnees from Brazil, but also greater um, influx of Eastern European Jews. Yes. And they would have been very grateful for more places to send. A lot of the charity in the community was taken up to send uh, the Polish and Lithuanian Jews back to Port uh, Poland and Lithuania. Um, and at the, at the same time though, they did not, I'm not sure they wanted to see a flourishing Jewish community in England, given the commercial rivalry. There's a question in the chat about uh, how your talk relates to the book, The Weight of Ink. It's a really good novel. Um, I think she did a great job. Uh, I think historical novels are a tough thing to pull off. And I thought she did a really nice job, um, both as a writer and in getting the historical details. This is a book about a woman who becomes a Torah scribe uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, Manasseh makes a cameo appearance, uh, as does Spinoza. So um, it's a, I recommend it as, as historical mm -hmm. novels go, and especially as novels about um, early modern Jewry. The other one I would recommend for those interested in, in English Jewry are David Liss's novels. Yeah. Um, the Coffee Trader and the Conspiracy of Paper. Isn't it uh, the boxer, isn't his name Benjamin Mendoza in the- um, Daniel. Daniel Mendoza? Daniel Mendoza. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, those are, those are very good historical novels too. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, shall we, um, shall we start to wind up? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can manage to share my screen. And, let me just say that anybody who has questions should feel free to um, email me. I'll be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe I won't show my screen, so I'll see if I can. Uh... I'm sorry, we have a technical problem, but no, no broadcast from us will be complete without a technical problem. So okay. let me see. I'll try, I'll try one more, one more time, and then. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Oh, I think it is trying. I'm sorry, Stephen. Um, earlier, I, I, I spoke your name incorrectly. Um, That's okay. We, we have we have Stevens in my family, and they 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 spell their uh, their name the other way, so that's why. Uh, and so we now confirm that this is not Manasseh ben uh, Ben Israel, but uh, that's correct. Else. Uh, and but, just remind everybody that um, Stephen's uh, Stephen's new book on on Spinoza is available from. Uh, all good booksellers and Amazon and, um, yeah. you know, I don't know if you're allowed out where you are, but... Uh, is sure, it sure. a philosophical book or biographical or... It's it's guide on how to live and how to die. <laughs> it's uh, it's philosophical, but, you know, written for the, the non-philosophic... Well, we're all philosophers, um, but for, mm. the, for the lay person. So trying to make Spinoza... Uh, accessible as a moral philosopher, someone with some guidance. First of all, I mean, before we, we start to wind up, thank you, thank you very much. It, it's um, it's interesting to hear that my own family history is just um, the result of uh, results of some people <laughs> bitching at each other. <laughs> but um, and um, if I can get to the next slide. Um, Next week, um, David Lisbona will be talking on From Glory to Dispersion, the Sephardic Lisbona family of, um, of Damascus. Uh, and this is, this is a, a genuine sort of um, S&P, like Western Sephardic family that, that was living in, um, in, in Syria. And he's done a huge amount of research on that. So we um, look forward to welcoming him uh, next week. And uh, just just to remind everyone that that, that Ton and I are, are self funding, and if you can um, help us, uh, it would be really greatly appreciated. And we have a a Patreon page at uh, www.patreon.com/safadi, and um, also that. Um, Ton and I are, are doing, um, helping people with their genealogical research, including for, for Portuguese citizenship applications. So if anyone needs a hand with that, just, just send us an email. And that's the, the, genu the, the email address um, we always uh, contact you from. Mm. So um, Ton, um, over to you. Yes. Oh, um... Thank you, Stephen, for this talk. Well, thank it's, you for uh, having me. It was a great pleasure. <laughs> it was a great pleasure for us and an honor to have you. Good. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We had a full house today. Yes. And uh, some, uh, some people turned to YouTube also. Uh, David may be able to tell us how many. And I wish everyone a nice evening or uh, afternoon, depending on where you live. And hopefully you will be here with us next week. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll just uh, unmute everyone if uh, anyone... Thank you. Excellent talk. I'll try to unmute everybody. Maybe no, not. <laughs> Right. Thank, thank you very much, everyone, and we look forward to to um, meeting next week. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Stephen. That was thank great, you. Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Where are you? Who okay, Paul. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hi, Francis. Hi. 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 Hi.